Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our first talk for this morning, we've got Mark Smith and Denise Pellucci, and they're from Dreamwith Studios in America. Now, their talk is called Build Your Own Contributors, One Part at a Time. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, I'm Denise Pellucci. And I'm Mark Smith. Obviously, you can probably figure that out. And uh, I've been working in social media for about 10 years or so, pretty much before it was called social media. And roughly about the same time for myself as well, starting with LiveJournal, moving on to places like Mozilla, Google, and now Dreamwith. We are about to tell you about Dreamwith because we think it's pretty interesting. Dreamwith Studios is a code fork of the LiveJournal.com blogging and journaling software. We uh, started our fork in about 2008 or so. Yeah, yeah give or take. Yeah. Um, so some of the interesting things about Dreamwith from our perspective, we're a pretty successful open source project at this point. We have over 65 unique contributors just to our code base. This doesn't count the wonderful people who help with support, translation, or documentation on the website, and the miscellaneous other tasks that go into a website. Um, at this point, we've been averaging roughly 40 to 50 commits per week, and that's sustained over the past, oh goodness, over the, at least the last year uh, since we really got into, got down in coding. And the reason that we find Dream With the Project interesting and why we think that we have something to say to you guys is because as things developed, our code contributor base wound up being about 75% uh, female, and interestingly enough, about 60% of the people who are contributing to our project have never touched Perl before, which is the language we're written in, have never touched open source before, or no most notably, have never programmed anything before. And I am actually in that case myself. When we started out, I was just going to be the business person, and now I think I'm the number four contributor on our uh, commit list. And the reason that this works are a bunch of techniques that we're going to be talking about to you now. Before we get into that, though. But first, we have a question for you. When you think of success in the terms of open source projects, how do you define that? How do you define personally if an open source project is successful or not? Is it lines of code? If you think it's lines of code, hands up. Anybody who thinks that... Uh... Is it purely output based? Is it your number of commits? How many people are committing every day, backing something out, committing the next thing? Is it your frequency of releases? If you hit two week release schedules, six week, eight week, two months, three years, Ten are you years. successful? Is that how you define it? Is it uh, how long your project has been running for? Um, is that what success is, if your project lasts for a while and keeps going strong? Anybody think that's it? How about uh, whether or not your project has any commercial applications, uh, whether you can sell it to other people, run a company on it? Anybody? OK, yeah. We think you're all wrong. <laughs> The number one thing that you measure the success of an open source project on is your people. Whether that's your users, the people who are using your software, the people who are contributing to your software, the people who are contributing to your project. And the neat thing is that you can take the people who are using your software and turn them into people who are contributing to your project. You know, it's so important, it's just your, your people. That's the important thing. And that's so important, in fact, that I, I want to put that in blink text. Uh, uh, sorry, Denise, it actually is 2010. We've kind of changed the way we do things nowadays. Geek. OK, so there are five things that are going to drive newcomers away from your project. And if you have any one of these five things that's going to be a problem, if you have more than one, you're really going to have a problem. So, and, and these are some of the things that we've identified in the past working in different open source projects, different communities. These are not everything. This is not a complete list. But these are some of the things that we've noticed that are explicitly difficult. Barriers to entry. If you find an open source project that you're interested in and that you want to contribute to, but you can't find any information on how to do it, their coding guidelines, patch submission guidelines, 
who runs the project, where do they hang out, what do they do, people get frustrated and leave. That's the first thing. The second thing, no clear expectations. You can learn about a project, where to contribute, how to contribute, what the project is, but if you have no idea what that project is trying to accomplish and what they expect of you as a contributor, it can be really difficult to get involved. Another problem that people run into is when your process moves at roughly the speed of ice moving over the tundra. We've all been in projects like that where it takes weeks or months to have a patch of yours looked at or to get an answer about a question, and that drives people away pretty quickly. There's also, uh, if there's a, a hierarchy of your developers, and this doesn't mean that you can't have um, developers who are more experienced than others, but if people start feeling like there's some sort of inner cabal who makes the decisions that they can't be a part of, that's going to make them feel excluded and they're gonna to wanna to leave. And finally, the fifth thing that drives people away is not having respect. If somebody feels like they're not being treated with respect for their time and the effort that they're bringing to you, they're gonna walk out. We're actually going to, this morning, um, not only let us talk about what we're doing with DreamWith, we're going to let our contributors talk too. We asked some of them for interesting things that they find most in, uh, useful about the DreamWith project. And here's the first uh, one that we have. I've tried getting into other projects, but I found the entrance very difficult. And not only do I code almost every day, but I'm the kind of person who attends hacker conferences. If I find it hard to find information on how to claim bugs, submit patches, and what programming style the project prefers, I shudder to think what programming beginners must think. And that brings us to our first main point, lowering the barriers to entry. The first and primary thing, document things. Document how you expect things to work. Simple things, your coding styles. Where do the parentheses go? Where do the spaces, tabs, things like that? Things that newcomers will get confused about because they've heard about other projects and how to do things. Let them know what you expect. Tell them how to do, how to work in your project. Conventions, how to submit patches, how to report bugs, how to work with the community, things like that. Document it so that people coming into your project have an idea of what's going on. And um, as a side note to that, if you have to explain something to two or three or four people at separate times, it means that there is a bug in your documentation. It's not a problem with the people who are not understanding you. It's a problem with your documentation not being clear enough. So if you have something that keeps cropping up over and over and over again, go back to the documentation. And more than that, get the person who most recently figured out the problem to update the documentation because it's gonna be freshest in their mind. Something else you can do in order to really encourage new people um, into your project, it's something that we started really early on, which is log bugs for everything that you want to do. Doesn't matter how small it is, if you've got, we have in fact opened bugs in our bug tracker for fix this one character on the website somewhere. And the reason that that helps bring in new contributors is that people will come in and take a look at your bug tracker and see that there's a wide variety of things for all experience levels. And that way they'll see something and go, I can do that. I'm gonna grab that and that gets them started and can keep going with you. On the other end of that process is keep a public change log. Uh, most projects are doing this, but the advantage to that is if you see all of the changelog commits going by, people who are new are going to see the changelog commit for a bug that they may have looked at earlier, thought, okay, I maybe know how to do that, maybe. I'll just keep an eye on that. Then when the patch comes through your changelog, they'll see how it was handled and they'll learn for next time. One thing that you can do that is a little more effort than some of the other things that we've got here. If your project is a website or um, anything server side or anything command line where you have complex install process, offer a hosted development environment. 
we actually started out with one of our contributors was offering space on her website for people who wanted to hack on the project. We thought it was so great that we took it up and started doing it. We now have about 70 people on our, our hack machine. We call them dream hacks. And that's the way that people don't have to spend time setting up the code in order to start hacking. It's already been done for them, and all they have to do is show up and start working. Similarly to the above with documenting everything and providing people the tools to do things, tell them where to go for help. Set something up so that when somebody has a question, where is this in the code, how do I do this bug, that they have a way and a place to go. You, whether it be your community, your IRC channel, your mailing list, et cetera. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, and the last thing on this particular point, we, we like to call this the typo test. Let's say you pull up your application, your website, your command line, as a new user, and you notice a typo. You misspelled a word on a button. To you as the project leader, as a contributor, somebody who's been on this project for a while, that's an easy fix. Go change it in the source, commit it. You don't have to go through Bugzilla. You don't have to go through a review queue. You don't have to wait for it to be pushed out. You have that power. But for a new contributor who comes into your project, who notices a typo on your website, on your button, how long will it take them to actually first fix this, understand enough about your community to learn how to submit that patch, how long will it take for your processes to review this patch, get it committed, and then get that pushed out? If this process is long, people lose interest. People wander away. They have better things to do with their time than wait six months for a typo to get corrected. It's, it can be quite, of a, quite a problem. So we try to go through this every couple of months just to make sure that our processes are still moving along and that people can still contribute effectively um, to our project. And what we'll do sometimes is we will grab the most recent newcomer and say, what did you find confusing, uncertain, and ask them because they are the experts in what it's like to be a newcomer to the project. The next quote, and again, these are all from our contributors. We asked them to tell us what they, what they like and don't like about contributing to Dreamwith just so we can keep a finger on the community. I think my favorite aspect of the Dreamwith project culture is that every contribution is welcomed, even if it's incomplete or flawed. There is a sense that we want to help developers improve instead of rejecting them for not meeting some sort of standard of quality. Which leads us into our next point, which is make sure that your people know what you expect of them. And if you set those expectations early and constantly reinforce them, you're going to get much better results. Which, of course, the first thing to do, document everything. Document, document, document. You should have social documentation as well as technical documentation which uh, the code of conduct or a diversity statement or some sort of way of telling people how you expect them to behave. Ours, uh, the URL here, dreamwith.org slash legal slash diversity, if you don't write that down, it's okay because you can go to Google and search for diversity statement and so many people liked ours that I think we're now the number two search result for that. It is Creative Commons licensed, you can use it. Please do. Please do, in fact. The uh, reason that this works, a diversity statement or a code of conduct, is not just to have it up there on your website looking pretty. The benefit of that is that when you have someone who is behaving badly, you have the ammunition to sit down and have a talk with them. Look, this is documented. We don't like that. Can we cut that out a little? I really want to emphasize this. One of the things that Dreamwith did very early on is explicitly state that we're interested in all sorts of contributors. It doesn't matter what their experience is, where they come from in life. It doesn't matter who they are. If they're interested in our project, we want them to help, and we want to give them the tools and the abilities to do that. And it's one of the biggest things that has helped us succeed so far. So really, take this. if you take anything away from this talk, read this, look at it, see how you can apply it to your project. The next point, give people goals. Everybody likes to work together in a team to accomplish something. Working up to that release, everybody works a little bit harder, a little bit faster. 
Everybody wants to see things get done and accomplish something. If you give them a goal, your community will work towards it. Create a culture where teaching is expected. This starts at the top. Replying to people on your mailing list who say, I can't find this in the code, when you've heard that question four times, first, you should have documented that. <laughs> Second, RTFM, not really a good response. If you start showing people that it's not beneath you to help out, it's not beneath you to spend your time teaching, showing people where to find things and helping out, your community will start doing the same. And as a matter of fact, as we were in our run up to open data and releasing, uh, the, opening the floodgates to allow people to create accounts on the hosted service, Mark got maybe five hours of coding time a week because he was spending the other 40 hours sitting, reviewing, and teaching. And that filters down and other people will take up that mantle. But now at this point, I don't have to do much of that. We have so many contributors now who are fired up about teaching, passing on knowledge, wanting to help out, that they do that. And it frees up a lot of my time for doing coding and you know, maintenance sort of things. And this all relates back to your project culture. Uh, we, we're social animals. You know, we like to get together in groups and do things together. And any group of people will have a culture of what is expected, what's OK, and what's not OK. And it's really important for us on an open source project to make sure that we're putting out a social environment where collaboration is rewarded over competition and uh, the, the whole check your ego at the door. It's really, really important to make sure that people in your project get that sense of social reward and approval for helping other people. Going back to our quotes, I'm also enjoying the aspect of contributing to something I use and care about. I wrote a patch. It's live on Dreamwith now. I can go and see what I did if I want. Which brings you, keep it moving. Keep running things on a, uh, fast forward. People have short attention spans. I mean, how many people right now are sitting here and kind of tuning out a little? Put your hand down. <laughs> if you can keep your project pace running quickly, people will get the sense of reward and satisfaction for seeing their name in your change log and also seeing their contribution in the product that they're using, which is why it's very important to work in steps. If you have a, a really, really big project or feature that you want to release, Knock it down into small little steps as much as possible. And again, you're going to be logging bugs for all of those little steps, right? And uh, that way, people who don't necessarily have time to commit to doing a huge extended project can pick up one little tiny piece of it. Manage your review queue. I know people submit patches. They go into Bugzilla. It's a lot more interesting and fun to spend time working on a bug on your own bug implementing that latest new feature, and know that nobody else is going to implement it because you've been doing this the longest, you've got the deepest knowledge of your project. But if you want to grow your contributor base, you have to spend time on it. Watch your review queue, keep it short, look at the patches, don't let them rot, even if it takes away from your coding time. And the other advantage to that is, as you have the contributors who are moving through the review queue, they're going to start reviewing other people's patches, and that's how you get more experienced contributors throughout this, the life cycle of the project. Which brings us to bike shed arguments. How many of you know what the term bike shed refers to? Good, okay, a good. majority of you. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, the uh, classic example of the meaningless argument is, what color do we paint the bike shed? People will argue about what color to paint the bike shed for months and years, whereas they wouldn't argue about something more complex. And when it boils down to it, it doesn't particularly matter which color you paint the bike shed. Keep your project moving as the, as the project leader either make the decision or empower your community to make the decisions. And this is a lot of things that we as project leaders will have to take to heart. Take a step back. Don't micromanage. Empower your contributors to make these decisions when it really is just about the color of the bike shed. Because it, down the road, if you don't like it, or if somebody else doesn't like it, or if it turns out it was the wrong color, you can change it. We've repainted the bike shed a couple of times already. Yes. 
Um, the last point for keeping things moving, be available. I know all of us have lives, and especially for people who are doing open source in their spare time or who have many different projects, it can be difficult to find time every couple of days to sit down and look at your bug mail, to look at your email, and respond to things. But this is vitally important. People like to know that they're being listened to. I mean, I like to know that when I contact someone that I'm going to get a response. Otherwise, why spend my time on that? Contributors, we're all the same. We want to know that we're being heard and that our contributions actually matter. Which uh, reminds me, I think I have some email from you I need to answer. Yes, uh, likewise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which brings us to our next quote. I like that every, uh, everybody cooperates and that it's really supportive. And that if you have a crisis of feeling like you're fucking everything up for a day, or that you've had a really crappy day and everything you've done has exploded, or what have you, that you won't be laughed at. This is something that I think a lot of us sometimes roll our eyes at because we've all been to those stupid management meetings where they pen you up in a room all day and ask you who moved your cheese. Team building is not a dirty word. Um, as we said, we are social creatures. We like to get a sense of reward from working together and cooperating. And if you have a strong team, you're going to have a strong project. The first thing that we made a real point of doing was emphasizing that everybody is allowed to make mistakes, even us, and sometimes especially us. We actually um, went for an idea of, if somebody commits a bug uh, that has a giant problem to it and we push it to the site and all of a sudden nobody can connect anything, not that I ever did this or anything like that. The problem is not, the attitude is not, oh my god, you just broke the site. It's, well, crap, okay, let's go fix that. And we actually have a concept, it's not a physical object, but it is an abstract concept known as the commit and ditch pony, which is awarded after every code push for uh, somebody who committed the patch with the, uh, the, the bug that broke everything, and I think I currently hold it. I thought but, I took that away from you, actually. Uh, actually, yeah, the last commit. Yeah, what? That was okay, me. Mark that was me. has it. But the point is that the commit and ditch pony does not just go to the developer who wrote the patch that broke the site. It also goes to the code reviewer who said, yes, it's OK to, to uh, commit this. And it goes to the code committer who uh, actually committed the, the, the bug because we're all working in this together, and it's all a team. And that's something else to think about. A lot of projects that I've, I've seen have an attitude where items in the bug tracker make them like roll their eyes and freak out because it means, oh my god, we have a bug. And if we put it in the bug tracker, then people are going to know we have a bug. Bug tickets are not flaws. You have bugs anyway. I mean, we all have bugs. I don't even want to talk about how many bugs we have right now. Logging bugs is not a flaw in your product. It's an opportunity to improve it. And what we do is make sure that we encourage an attitude where everybody knows that logging a, a bug into our Bugzilla is perfectly OK and is actually a good thing, because it means that we're going to have a chance to make it better. Another thing that's important to do is uh, keep your process open. Um, sometimes in a project, we find that there are certain people who are um, the center of attention and the ones who are doing everything. And again, this doesn't mean that you can't have more senior, experienced contributors who work on specific areas of things. But everybody should know what the decision-making process is, how they can get something changed, how they can put through a suggestion, and how they can actually get a, a, a feature added. We have actually on our website a form that people can go and fill out, make a suggestion. It will go through community discussion. And then if the community approves of the feature or the change, then it'll go into Bugzilla. Code ownership can be dangerous. We've all been on projects where there is somebody who they own the UI, or they own the network stack, or something in particular. And a lot of the times, you need these people, people who are really vested in a particular area of a project, 
who spend their time really understanding the depth of TCP IP. And without those people, I, I would shudder to think. But you need to watch that these people are stewards and are not territorial, that these people aren't driving people away, keeping people out of these areas simply because they enjoy the power or they just want to be in full control. The things that we say you should apply to your project overall also need to apply to every little area. Don't, <laughs> patches. We all like to see the big patch. When somebody submits a 3,000 line patch with unit tests, with full <laughs> UI translated, it works, everything, it's, it's glorious. It, it has it's, documentation, it has facts, and there are comments in the code. And it's just what you wanted. We all love that, that's great. But think for a second, uh, we have Macs up here. I have been enjoying Macintosh computers since OS X came out. What is the real difference between a Mac and a PC right now? It's the little things. It's the little touches, the things that just make it a joy to work with. Little patches tend to focus on those. Little interface enhancements, clarif clarification of wording, things like that. The little patches have a disproportionately huge impact on your project. So when that big patch comes in and a couple little patches come in, don't, don't get rid of the little patches. Don't ignore them. Encourage those con contributors and those types of contributions. This goes for other things as well. Cleanup, refactoring, documentation, the typically less glorious parts of open source development, the things that aren't features or whatever, we need to focus on those because those are the things that will help people get into your project and really be vested in it. And particularly to note is that a lot of time when you have those little patches coming in, they'll be scratching somebody's particular itch. And a lot of times those will have to do with software accessibility issues. And so if you take those patches and deal with them, your software is going to become more usable by everyone and more accessible to everyone, which is definitely a plus. This is actually one of the stories that I like the most because I asked what everybody remembered for their favorite moment. I recall one moment in IRC when someone submitted a patch to a much wanted bug. There was massive cheering and the dev said wistfully that this was why he was wanting to submit patches here and not at the day job because while the day job paid, it did not provide a cheering squad, much less a genuinely enthusiastic one. Which brings us to the single, solitary, individual, exclusive, lone, uttermost, paramount, most, most important, important thing. thing to do. Yes, we rehearsed that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to build your own contributors, the most important thing you can do is to have R-E-S-P-E-C-T, I promise not to sing. Thank you. You're welcome. People need to know that they're respected, that they're valued, and that you care about the time and effort that they're bringing to you. First thing to do is to make sure that you're always keeping them in the loop, that people feel like if they come to your project, your IRC channel, your communities, your website, your blog, whatever public channels you use, people should feel like they can make themselves aware of everything that's going on without having to dig in too deeply so that they feel like they have some sort of sense of investment in the project. Similarly for patch development, I mean, you might think that this respect is a touchy feeling thing that only really applies when you're talking to someone, but it applies to everything. When somebody submits a patch and you look at it and it's not exactly what you're looking for or it's broken, it doesn't have unit tests, and it basically will never get committed. You know that, and you know why, but the new contributor doesn't. Take, have some time, have some respect for the time that this person has put into your project. Tell them why their patch is not going to be committed. Take a few minutes, it may cost you just a few minutes to let them know, thank you for your contribution, we appreciate your interest in our project, but this patch is not gonna work for, for these couple of reasons. Have you considered this or that? They will come back. They will be thankful for the time that you took to let them know. They might be mad for a little while, but at least you, you did what you could to, to smooth that over. Similarly, we've all gotten patches where they just didn't follow the style guideline. 
completely terrible. And you kick them back and say, please see the style guideline. But really, if those patches were good, they had their unit test, it worked, and it was exactly what you wanted, it'll take you five minutes to fix the white space. If you really have a strong culture of follow the style guidelines, as the committer, it'll take you five, 10 minutes to fix it. But if you reject that patch, think of the human cost. Think of how it feels when you're the one who submitted a patch, put yourself out there, and then you get it kicked back because they had a space in the wrong place. This is something that will disproportionately affect newcomers. And again, I am perfect testimony to this. Our code guidelines say that there's no quote marks around hash keys or hash refs or something. And I'm looking at this. I have no idea what this means. I learned Perl like six, nine months ago and came in with no computer science background. So I keep submitting patches that have the quotes and the spaces in the wrong place. And I have this mental block about what exactly this means. And every time I do it, it's wrong. If I do it one way, it's wrong. I'm a little bitter here. But Mark will take my patches, and during code review, instead of taking this patch that works just fine and kicking it back to me and saying, fix the bloody quote marks, he just does it himself. Thank you. Toxic people. We all have those people on our projects. And uh, when we say toxic people, we mean the person where if you mention this person's name to a third party on your project, you'll get, oh yeah, them, sorry. You need to have a little bit of control over those people because we find that, again, we people, social creatures, if we don't provide a social outlet on our project, people are going to start creating it anyway. They'll be creating the unofficial mailing list to discuss last night's American Idol. They'll be creating the IRC back channels to sit and discuss things. As a matter of fact, I think right now our contributors are watching us streaming in IRC. Hi, guys. These social channels are going to crop up anyway. So what you can do in order to make the experience more pleasant is sit down with your toxic people and make sure they know the code of conduct is expected of them in the social channels as well as the technical channels. Make sure that if they are causing problems, you're going to sit down with them, have words. If that you have a little control over that, people are going to find the experience a lot more pleasant. These people, it doesn't matter how technically adept they are. It doesn't matter how much they're contributing to your code base. They could be the most genius coder anywhere. They're driving people away from your project. And you can't actually count the cost because you don't know how many people are disappearing without telling you a word. Sometimes you're going to have to say no. Sometimes your uh, contributors will come to you and say, we want to rewrite the entire code base in C sharp. True story. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to tell them no. If you tell them no, it's really important to make sure that you tell them why you're telling no them no and come up with some other alternatives. No, we can't rewrite the entire code base in C Sharp, but what do you like about it? What do you want to get out of that? Let's see what we can do that will have an approximate same effect. If you do that and the two of you together come to an understanding, that person's going to feel more connected into the decision-making process. And of course, while you are giving these answers, keep asking yourself the number one question, are these words that are coming out of my mouth right now, are they actually bullshit? Because people have really good bullshit detectors. And they don't like it. They really don't like it. So if you have a project culture of always being honest with your people, you can come to them and say, no, you can't do this. But they're going to respect why you're telling them no, because they know that you're not lying to them. And if you follow all of these, 
I ideas and you implement some of them on your project, uh, you may very well find that in another couple of months, one of your contributors is turning around and saying something like this. I think I found a new home. It's kind of cool. Now, these are kind of uh, very high-level abstract ideas that we've been talking about here. So we figured we'd give you guys uh, three things that you can start doing right now in order to improve the environment and process of a project that you're working on right now. First is freshman orientation. We all remember if we went to college, the first week we'd arrive a, a week earlier than everybody else and there'd be a, a, a sheet of paper about this long with events and social uh, gatherings and mixers and then the unofficial mixers that had all the booze in them. But uh, what you do is you can appoint a welcome wagon for uh, your community. This is separate from the community manager. The community manager is the person who's handling the liaison to the community as a whole. If you have a welcome wagon, freshman orienter, whatever you want to call them, their responsibility is specifically to interface with people who are just joining your project. Point them to the resources that are available, point them to all of the information, and that way people who are new have, first of all, been contacted proactively which makes them feel good and valued and noticed. And second of all, they know where to go when they have questions. Our freshman orientation coordinator is actually the person who runs our hosted development environments. And she's the one who sets things up for everybody who is new when they want to have the, their, uh, their hack, their dream hack. And she has the patience of Job, I will tell you that. But <laughs> She is the person that people know they can come to and ask questions. And the attitude, of course, is there's no such thing as a stupid question. And that way people feel secure, like they, they know what's going on. Yeah, and, and really, like, you may think, oh, this sounds like a lot of work. Once you have a thriving community, once you've started building it up, it starts building itself. Um, this particular person who handles our newcomer orientation and our dream hacks, she's amazing. We, we, we talk to her every day, but we don't have to guide her, direct her. She does things, she takes initiative, and she runs this, and she's really good at it. And the reason that she can do that is because she knows that if she has a problem, she can come to us, and she is empowered to solve the problems herself without having to come to us. And that's an idea that we try and really foster in the community as a whole. Yes, which brings us to communications. We like to communicate. I'm sure that that's probably why you're at this conference, partially because we like technical knowledge, but we like getting together. We like talking to people, and we like to know that there's other people out there doing what we do, going through what we've gone through, that sort of thing. We like to go out drinking, too. Well, yeah, that too. Um, but communicate. When someone contacts you, email, I am. Bugzilla, whatever your preferred method of choice, get back to them. Even if it's a short note that says, I got your mail, I'll have to think about it, and I will get back to you. If any of you have done consulting or you know, working for yourself or clients, it's the same basic sort of rule. Client emails you during business hours, your rule of thumb, you should get back to them within an hour or two and acknowledge that they got to you. Even if you don't have their answer, it's good business. Similarly, it's good with your community. And speaking of community, your problem child. You know who your problem child is. I have a, everybody knows who the problem child is. Sit down with them. Have a talk with them and let them know that what they're doing, the behavior that they're showing is driving people away. Because in a lot of projects that I have been involved with, in a lot of projects that I've been around the periphery of, the problem children and the toxic people are allowed to take over the methods of communication. And if you, as the project leader, sit down with that person and say, OK, look, here's our code of conduct. We'd really appreciate it if you could tone down some of what you're doing just a little, because we're having some reports that people are having problems with that. If you do that, First of all, it shows to the rest of your community that you are actually treating them with respect and you're not going to let somebody keep annoying them. 
And second of all, it actually shows to your problem child that you are expecting there to be an element of respect in all of the communications because we are really all working on this together. So we want to thank you for your time, for listening to us. Um, we do have a couple of minutes left for questions. Um, but as you can see, uh, dreamwith.org slash create, if you're interested in our project or just creating an account, see what we do. It'll ask you for a code. LCA 2010 is your code. It'll let you create an account. And then once you've created an account, if you're interested in finding out more about our development process or um, in talking with, to, to us in detail about anything that we've uh, been discussing today, you can join the DW Dev community, which will be suggested to you if you use the uh, create code that's on the screen. And that's where we coordinate all of our training. You can also see our wiki, which is at dwscoalition.org. Thank you very much. Thank and if, you very much. Uh, <laughs> please wait for the mic for questions. Uh, thanks for a, a great talk. Uh, I think there's lots of excellent advice there. But uh, the thing is, I think, with a lot of open source projects is the people who become uh, kind of significant developers in projects are there because they, they love the tech. And, you know, for them it's about the tech and it's not about the people. So it's – I don't know if you have any – you know, I don't think a lot of developers I know would be keen to feel like their main role is actually – managing people or managing the community as opposed to hacking themselves, even though, you know, if you're really focusing on your community like that, I think that is true. So I don't know what's needed there, if uh, there's something we can do to change people's ideas about that or just have people come in who already have that idea. So um, this is, can you hear me? So okay. personally, it's kind of a, a, it's a mental um, realignment in the sense of what is your priority? If your priority is to make tech, then maybe you're fine with a project where you don't emphasize any of these, you don't do any of these, and you just make tech. And if that's what your goal is, then okay. Be honest about that, and that's fine. But if your goal is, like us, to actually build a community, to build contributors, because honestly, I only have so many hours in the day, there's only so much tech that the two of us can build ourselves. To me, it's important to build a community that can then build the tech and everything. So it may be a little bit of sacrifice on my time, but personally, it's worth it. And the other thing uh, that I have to say to that is uh, you don't need 100% universal buy-in from your contributor base. We do have some people who are only interested in sitting and hacking, and uh, you know we love them. They're the ones who sit there and work on the insanely complicated stuff. But uh, I, th I think you really need a balance of uh, people people and tech people. And again, that goes back to the creating the project culture. If you let people know that it's expected, that they don't have to be touchy-feely all the time, but at the very least, they have to avoid pissing other people off, that's a good start. All right. Um, well, I always love hearing about working communities, so that has been very motivational. Thank you for that. Um, there is a small divide I saw in your presentation, and maybe you can bridge it. Um, in the beginning, you said something about avoid the hierarchies, and yet a lot of your slides were sort of like imperative, like do this, do that, and specifically you said things like um, just shut down the bike shit arguments and moderate social channels and kick out the problem children. How do you get to that point of making these executive decisions and yet avoid the sort of hierarchy to make sure that everyone is more or less treated the same? I think that uh, pretty much every ship needs one captain, sometimes uh, two captains, but projects uh, do need the project leader uh, necessary to make the decisions and make sure that things are moving along and moving forward. Um, the, our, our point with the um, avoiding hierarchy is that you want to make sure that you as the project leader are uh, available to other people and uh, that you are specifically fostering the community and promoting people from the community up to the level of contributor. Avoid the closed hierarchy. 
let people know that they can actually participate. They, they know that they're not going to be the project leader, but they feel that they have, you know, a horse in the race, that they can actually be a part of the project going forward. Am I working? Thank you very much for presenting this talk to us on behalf of LCA. Nice bottle of wine for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.